you can sit there and and wallow and pity about it, like I almost died, and what if it happens again, and get yourself all nervous, or you can or you can be the person that's like, okay, um, that happened, and I'm still going to deal with this emotionally, but how can I use this to make myself better? You are listening to Spartan Combat on Spartan Up. Learn from battle-tested combat athletes with your host, Ryan Warner. Spartans! Welcome back to the combat series. My guest today is Jay Jackson, a former Stanford wrestler, now teacher, who shares his experience of being held at gunpoint and how that impacted the rest of his life. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by our friends Juliet and Kelly Starrett at The Ready State. Get a free trial and then save 10% for life by using the code SPARTAN10 when you register at thereadystate.com. Jay Jackson, welcome to the podcast, sir. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm very happy and honored to be here. Love the podcast, huge fan. And seeing your line of guests, I'm just incredibly humbled. Well, we're going to thank Joe DeSena for the Joe DeSena for this one. Um, he said there was this Olympic wrestler, Jay Jackson, but uh, no, I'm, I'm kidding, of course. Um, but no, it's it's great to have you on, man. And I, I'm nervous about this conversation because I know we're going to go with some sensitive places. I'm excited because I don't think people fully understand just how incredible your story is through a number of angles. So let's dive right on into it, man. When did the wonderful sport of wrestling enter your life, Mr. J? So my dad, my dad is a wrestling coach and actually a Hall of Fame wrestling coach in Washington. He wrestled at University of Washington, then he was an assistant coach there, and then he had a 35 plus year coaching career. So it's something I was always born into. And it kind of runs two generations deep. My grandpa was a was a wrestler. So he was an amateur wrestler and a professional wrestler in Colorado. And he actually used to go around from mining camp to mining camp and challenge challenge people to wrestle. That's how he made money during the depression. So it runs, it runs at least two generations deep. Plus genetically, I'm kind of predisposed to this. Um, I was blessed with a, I'm not the tallest mountain in the range. And I was blessed with a lack of ability to run fast or jump high. So there's only a few sports that I can do. So thank goodness for wrestling. And, you know, wrestling is just the tip of the iceberg because the structure that in which you grew up, your dad, you know, had you doing things that the normal kid can't even conceive of. So what was it, what was it like growing up with your father? And what were some of the things he had you doing at a young age? So first off, my dad, was a green beret. And I didn't know that until I was in eighth grade. And one of my friends came up to me and said, Hey, I, I heard your dad was a green beret. And I went home that night and I was like, dad, um, Nick said, you're a green beret. Is that true? And my dad just said, yeah. And then that's all we talked about it for a couple of years. So pretty, pretty humble guy, um, but very tough. And I'm from a pretty affluent area in Washington, uh, Mercer Island, Washington, which is a suburb of, of Seattle. And it's not, it's, it's, not the toughest area, I would say, because of because of the affluence. It's not certainly not a blue collar area. And kids in my area could be could be maybe not as tough as as say a farm kid. So my dad didn't want that. He wanted his his kids to be tough. So he used to test us with things. And I'll just answer that question mostly by saying my dad did it right. And you can you can push really hard if you have two things, and those things are structure and support. Uh, for my dad, that's that structure was, I always knew that he wasn't going to do anything too crazy. I knew it was going to be something, but it wasn't going to be something he threw at me that was like way outside the realm of something I could deal with. And I also knew that there was that support, you know, he was there to help me through the process, kind of coach me through it. And if I failed, which, you know, is often the case, then he was going to be there. And if you have those things, you can do a lot of stuff. And I'll say, you know, some of those things were a little crazy, um, you know, from not from my perspective, because I understood what was happening, but from other people's perspectives. Um, you know, one of those things that's going to come up later is he used to, you know, have us wrestle blindfolded. And, you know, and his thought on the thing was, and I understood this, his thought was, if you wrestle blindfolded, then when you wrestle in a match where you're not blindfolded, it's going to be easier. So I'm, I guess I won't, I won't get into the depths of how hard my dad pushed me, but let's just say he pushed, he pushed hard, but it's something I always understood and that support was always there. Yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's cool to see it pay off later in life. And so you, you wrestle, um, when, in high school, would you say you were like, completely engrossed with it or were you still juggling multiple sports and kind of didn't know which way you wanted to go yet? So 
when it came to wrestling with me, I just, I had a passion for it. And passion for me, purpose that's kind of supercharged by emotions. So my dad didn't let me start as, as much as I was around wrestling and watching it. My dad didn't let me start until like late sixth grade, early seventh grade. And at that point, you've got other people, you're kind of playing a little bit of catch up, but it's a good thing, you know, because you see, you see a direction you're going to go and you see the purpose and, you know, I've got to work these things and get better so I can, I can catch those guys, which seems, seems to me to be a lot easier thing than being the person that's trying to stave off, you know, all the people that are trying to, trying to catch you. And the emotion part for me is, is that you, once you start seeing your improvements and stuff, then you get pride and, and you kind of enjoy that feeling. So I'm kind of glad my dad started me when he did because I've never gotten tired of the, of the sport. Uh, just, just love it and today still love it. Man, and th- what you're doing through some of the, I guess the, I don't know if you call it mental training and we're gonna get into that is, is awesome because it, it impacts kids who, you know, maybe wrestling isn't for them but there's still ways to, to kind of get that mentality. Um, and so you get to Stanford how did this this insane story kind of come come to be and you know what was your experience with it yeah you re- you referenced earlier this is going to be an interesting conversation i don't i don't talk about this stuff very much um and a lot of times when i talk about it i go right back there so i'm going to apologize from the get go in case i you know start stuttering or or you know start saying um or you know too much but I will say it started, I, I went to Stanford, I wrestled there, um, had, a decent, had a decent career, and then stuck around to be an assistant coach. And the first, when I was an assistant coach, this, this man, after practice, this guy comes up to me in the parking lot. And he tells me, he tells me hey, um, you live in the greenhouse condominium complex, don't you? And I said, yeah, I do. And he said, I live there too. My car broke down. Can you give me a ride? So tells me his name is, is Tony, he's from Brazil, and I give him a ride, and then at the end of the ride, he says, you know, my car is going to be in the shop for a while, is it possible you can give me more rides? And I said, well, practice is over about 5, 30, or 6, and, you know, I get out there, you know, about half an hour after that time, if you're out here, then sure, that's fine with me, and I gave him maybe four or five rides during a two-week period, and then the night this, the night this incident occurred, um, I get a knock, get a knock at my door, and it's this guy, and who, and I opened the door, he tells me that he's, and he had told me on the rides before that he was a computer science you know, student at Stanford, but he was also taking English classes because he's from another country. And he just, he told me that he needed help with his English assignment. So I was like, yeah, come on in, um, you know, I'll help you with your English assignment. So I was helping him. And then he tells me, you know, I'm, I'm locked out of my apartment right now or out of my condo right now. And I just need, I just, I'm gonna go get a hotel room tonight. And I told him, you know, don't worry about it. We'll try and get your keys. If we can't get your keys, then you can just you can just stay here. Um, then after that, I had a compression wrestlers come over just to talk. And as they came over, this guy, you know, I'm going to answer the door. This guy makes a beeline for the bathroom and locks himself locks himself in the bathroom. So these these freshman wrestlers, one being Tim Kendall, who I think you're gonna interview later. Yeah. Uh, but these freshman wrestlers, I was. You know, I was talking to them for about 45 minutes and then that, that gets overlapped with my friends who, who come over to the condo and they're over for like 45 minutes. So my friends, you know, we're going to go out that night and they're a little uncomfortable because they're like, there's, there's a guy in the bathroom, what's going on here? Um, I said, everything's fine. He's a good guy. You know, everything's not a problem. So my friends are like, well, we want to go out to the bars. Uh, so they said, are you coming or not? So I go to knock on this, knock on this guy's door or on the bathroom door, or open it. Um, and he's in there and he's kind of doubled over. And I said, is everything okay? And he's like, no, I just feel sick. Can I just stay here? And you know, I'm not terribly comfortable with that. But I said, I said, hey, you know, wouldn't it be better if we maybe, if we maybe just broke into your place, you know, you can, you can be there tonight. And he's like, really, I, I don't feel like I can move right now. Can you just, can you just please let me stay here? So I said, that's fine. I'm going to leave you a blanket and a pillow. You can stay on the couch and just get yourself better. We're going to go out to, we're going to go out to the bars and I'll be back and I will see you when I come back. So thank goodness I'm not a drinker because um, I had my wits about me that evening, but that's how, that's how everything kind of, kind of starts off. So were you, uh, were you not wondering when he's in the bathroom for an hour and a half, what the heck's going on in there? Are you like any red flags coming up yet? Yeah. It's, it's interesting because 
if I were to watch like a TV show where this happened, I'd just say, what an idiot that guy is that let this guy, let this guy stay in his house. But in the situation, you know, I didn't, I didn't think much of it. You know, yeah. I, I'm going to, I'm going to be nice. And if I were in that situation where I was sick in a bathroom, I'd, I'd want someone to let me stay at their house. Of course. Um, anyways, of course. we come back, we come back at like one in the morning and my friend's not terribly comfortable with it. And he's like, I just want to check this thing out make sure it's okay. And it's very much, again, like a, like a bad movie. And I open the door and this with my friend and this guy's got the TV on and he's laying on the couch, but he's got the cover pulled up over his face. So my friend can't really see what he looks like. And you've got the TV light that's shining on him. And I finally convinced my friends, all gonna be fine. You know, I'll be, I'll be good. Um, I'll see you later. Thanks for, thanks for thinking about me. So I get ready for bed and I go in my room and, you know, lay in my bed and maybe a minute later, I hear my door, you know, creaking open very slowly. So I sit up a little bit and I said, Hey, uh, Hey, what's going on? And then he, then he clicks the light on. He's got a, he's got a 22 caliber revolver pointed right at me. And it's a situation where remember it very vividly. And you could see the, you could see the ammunition in the, in the barrel. So um, I started saying, you know, what are you doing here? You know, what's, what's going on? He said, don't worry about it, just roll over. And I said, what are you doing here? Just, just roll over. So I'm, I'm kind of stuck. There's only one door to my bedroom. It's not a very big bedroom and he's covering that door. So I had to roll over. Um, he stuck his knee in my back and the gun in my, in the back of my neck. And then he started, started tying me up. He tied my, tied my arms behind my back and he tied my feet together. And he, he brought some ribbons with him to do that, but he also took the shoelaces out of my shoes uh, to tie me up. And then he also, he also took some of my nice shirts and ties to tie me up, which kind of made me mad because those things went into evidence later and I didn't get them back. Anyways, um, you know, then, he, then he blindfolded me and, and put a pillowcase around my eyes. And then, you know, then I, he let me turn over and you know, sit up a little bit but I'm sitting there blindfolded. My hands are binded behind my back and my feet are together, you know, binded together. And they starts asking me, he starts asking me a bunch of questions like, you know, you know, he's, or excuse me, I start asking him questions like, why are you here? And at the time I was living with Chris Harpel, who is the wrestling coach at Stanford. Um, so part of the, part of the being the assistant coach at Stanford is you got to, you know, get free board in the Bay area at Chris's house. So it worked out, that worked out well for me, but he told, he told me he was there because, you know, this, these, these guys had told him that they need to get some papers from the wrestling coach. And, you know, he said, I have the papers, I have the papers, so it's all good. And then, you know, then I asked him, why do you, why do you have me tied up? He didn't answer that. Um, for about 45 minutes, we're having we're having a conversation and this is before the internet is big and he knows quite a bit about my friends you know jimmy gary matt kano ed medina he starts starts asking me questions about my friends and where they're from and i don't know how he knows this information but it's all starting to become weirder and weirder keep going I okay mean, keep going <laughs> jesus That's so crazy so for for 45 minutes for 45 minutes, I'm talking to him. And, and it's, it's bizarre because at times he would get upset with me. Like earlier that day, I'd given a freshman wrestler a ride home. And I guess he was out there and he said, I saw you with that tall, dark haired guy. And he goes, you gave him a ride. He didn't give me a ride. So again, I don't know where this, where this whole thing is going. And then there's times where he was talking calm to me. And that's, you know, that was my thing. I was just trying to, just trying to keep him calm. But then after 45 minutes, you know, I'm, he's, I'm trying to, He's asking me like how, how my brother and sister and I could all go to Stanford at the same time with a dad who's a PE teacher, you know, and I'm explaining financial aid to the guy and it just dawns on me that, that, uh, hey, if I don't stop talking, he's never going to leave. So I finally, finally turned, turned my back to him, or excuse me, and didn't turn my back to him. But I said, you know, I really, you know, I like talking to you. I think you're a nice guy, but right now I'm blindfolded, uh, tied up. You've got a gun and I'm scared. I said, you've got these you got these papers you said you wanted. Can you just please leave? And he tried to talk to me some more. I said, really, I don't want to talk to you. Can you just please go? And then he gagged me. He stuck a washcloth down my throat um, far enough where it actually elicited a gag reflex and then tied that around my head with another pillowcase. So now before, you know, I'm gagged and before I could see some light, um, but, but now I'm, I'm not seeing any light. And then for the next 45 minutes, 
for the next 45 minutes. It's kind of quiet in the room. I don't know where he is. Um, but I'll tell you what's going through my head at the time is that, you know, look, if, if I can get my hands free, if I can get my hands free, I'm going to be okay in the situation. Because when I was younger, my dad had me wrestle blindfolded, you know, so yeah. I'm fine being blindfolded as I think a lot of wrestlers would be, you know, you know, where body parts are if you wrestle. So I'm like, if I can get my hands on this guy, if I can get my hands free and get my hands on him, then, um, I can make something happen. Yeah. But at this point, I'm just trying to figure out where he is. Cause I don't know if he's got the gun, if he's in a different room, what's going on. So I finally hear him on one side of the room and I turn my back towards him and start, you know, because I can't talk, I'm using hand signals and my hand signals were, you know, you know, I would tap myself and then say, say, okay, like I'm okay. And I would put my hands in a please, please fashion, say please. And then I'd say, go with my hands. So I kept doing that. I'm okay, please go. And luckily he figured out what I was trying to say to him. And he's like, no, you're not okay. He goes, I can't, I can't bear to see you like this. And then he sits on the bed next to me. Um, and he just says, you know, Jay, if you just fall asleep, I promise I'll go. Um, so then I pretended to, then I pretended to shiver. You know, I wasn't cold, but you know, I wanted, I wanted my hands out of sight. And again, that's the same thing with wrestling. You've got to find a way, right? You've got to be, you've got to be optimistic about everything. You know, there's, you're going to find, find a way to beat this guy. Um, that's what I'm, that's what I'm thinking mindset wise. So I shiver and he puts the covers over me and now that's good. Cause now my hands are out of sight. And then he asked me, you know, will it help you sleep if, if I turn the lights off? And to me, that doesn't mean anything because I can't see anything anyways, I'm blindfolded, but I nod, yeah, you know, I want the lights off because now, now I'm going to be under the covers and the lights are going to be off and he won't be able to see me trying to get my hands undone. So he turns the lights off and then he lays in the bed next to me, which is, you know, that was uh, not a good, not a good feeling. And it certainly, certainly made me go more rapidly and think more rapidly how I'm going to get out of this. Um, so, so it takes me, it takes me about, you know, I, I turn to face him, turn to face him laying in the bed. My hands are away from him, lights are out under the sheets. And it, it took me about 15 minutes to get my hands undone. And the side story here is that when I was a freshman uh, at Stanford, I was the only small freshman on the traveling squad. So I got, I got picked on on occasion. I was probably a little too lippy too. So, you know, so there was maybe reasons for people to to do things to me. But um, on a couple of occasions, I got tied up by, by people. One, one time being our assistant coach, Eric Deuce, um, who I never thought it would help me, but, but I, day after this incident happened, I called Deuce and, and thanked him for saving my life. But I can tell you the first time I was tied up um, by my teammates, by my teammates or by coach Deuce was when I kept my hands together. So my wrists, my wrists were flush and he, Deuce tied me up and I couldn't get out of it. It took me like an hour. So I started thinking about that. Like next time someone ties me up, I'm gonna keep my wrists apart. So next time, next time Deuce ties me up, I keep my wrists apart and then you've got room to move once he's gone and you can get out of there. So again, never thought I'd be thanking people for tying me up, uh, but it certainly saved my life as did the sport of wrestling. So I got my, you know, because of that, I got my hands undone and I pulled them out in front of me. And now I've got to just locate where he is. I know he's laying in the bed, but I just want to know where his body position is. Yeah. So I kind of, mum I kind of mumble something because I've, I'm gagged and I mumble, mm, you know, and, and he's, he's like, what? So now I know where he's at and I just want to make sure. So I mumbled one more time and he's like, what is it? And then I jumped him um, with my hands. And as a wrestler, you know, I'm going to say this again, thank goodness I'm not a tennis player, you know, and thank goodness I was a wrestler because that's, that's what saved my life. And thank, thank goodness Thank goodness I grew up, um, you know, wrestling blindfolded. Again, never thought there'd be a direct correlation, but there is. Um, you so know, when you grab them, went, are you feeling like where the gun's at in case his finger's on it? I mean, can you feel the so gun? So what I did was, what I did was I reached for him and then went right to his wrists. Yeah. And again, with wrestling, you can tell if someone's gripping something or not, you know, if you've, if you've got their wrist and he wasn't gripping anything. And he's yelling, I've got the gun, I've got the gun, but I knew he, I knew he wasn't because I didn't feel that tension in his, in his mm -hmm. wrist. So plus, and I thought for a split second, maybe he does have the gun, but I'm like, screw this. This is my only, this is my only chance. Not like I'm going to let go right now. So I went, I went off the wrist with my right hand to the back of his head and jammed it. There's a, there's a chair next to my bed. So I jammed it between the chair next to my bed and the bed. And then we fell, we fell on the floor. Um, he's on his back. 
I'm on top, we're face to face to each other, maybe a few inches away. And um, once, so once still I got- tied, head, head still covered at this point? Correct, correct. So once I got him on his back, then it was, I got to get inside Ty. And I got to pull his arms towards his body because he's, that gun could be anywhere. If he reaches and grabs that thing, then, you know, I'm a, I'm a goner. So once I got him, once I felt I got him pretty secure, um, I got, I got, I got the blindfold, I got the blindfold off, but it's still, still very dark in there. And it's very hard to see, which again, I've got the advantage in that situation. Cause this guy, there's no way, there's no way he trained wrestling and there's no way he had the dad that I had. Right. Um, so this is, and this is weird too. Um, you know, the first thing I could think of to do, cause I, I'm thinking, I just gotta, I just gotta get this guy and, you know, get him to stop writhing around so much. And the third, first thing I thought to do is double fish hook him, which this, the story behind that is we MMA had just started, just started at the time. And we were having a discussion in the team van. And I was talking to Todd Sermon, you know, the late Todd Sermon, who is mm -hmm. an All-American and a Midlands champion for, for Stanford. Um, and we're saying, what would you do in an MMA fight? And Todd's like, I would, I would totally double fish hook somebody. You know, and double fish hooking is taking your two index fingers and putting them, it's, oh, yeah. kind of, it's putting them inside someone's mouth. And it's, it's kind of what big brothers do to little brothers. Um, and I remember Todd saying, I'd double fish hook somebody. And me telling Todd, you know what, that's stupid. You know, I'd never, that's, I'd never do that. And then all of a sudden I'm in the situation. That's what I was, that's what I was doing. Um, but he definitely stopped writhing around so much. And then after that, he's just, like I said, he's reaching for things. I'm trying to grab inside tie and control him. And, and, uh, every time I could, I'd hit him and every time I could, I'd headbutt him. And I've never yeah. been in a real, real fight before, but thank goodness I'd been in, you know, hundreds of practice fights. So, and it was kind of nice to add the, at the time to add the hitting and the headbutting. So, so I, I do that. And the worst part of it is he's trying to push away from me and, and I've got my feet are still tied and he's pushing off the binds that are between my feet and it hurt like a son of a gun, but you know, and, and I will say this too, I, I had another assistant coach named Mike Schmidlin who, you know, Schmidlin, if you've never heard of him, he's, he's, I think he still has a career record for wins and pins at Midlands. He went, he went to that tournament for over a decade, um, kept wrestling and he is, he is wow. the toughest person I know. And Schmidlin, Schmidlin, he, he, would, he lives in our area at Stanford and he used to come into wrestling practice. And I remember, you know, everyone, when he would walk in, everyone would try and hide, not make eye contact with him because, because he's, he's so tough. And if you wrestle Schmidlin, he's going to hurt you. So basically if he beats you, he's going to hurt you, mm -hmm. not injure you, but he's going to hurt you and, and make you uncomfortable so he can pin you. And if you beat him, he's going to hurt you. You just know it's going to come. <laughs> so, so for me, for me, it used to be, I used to be the guy that didn't want to make eye contact with him, but pretty soon he's like, you're my guy. You're around my weight. I'm trained for Midlands. Um, you're going with me regardless. And it just made me tough. At some point I realized, you know, this is going to hurt. So I might as well enjoy it and, you know, fight, fight through this thing. And, you know, it got to the point where when Schmidlin used to show up to the room, um, I'd get super excited. You know, I get to wrestle with Schmidlin today. This is awesome. So those things go back to me when, when I, this guy's pushing on my binds, you know, because I've dealt with, I've dealt with pain before I'm, you know, I'm a wrestler and I've wrestled Mike Schmidlin and it just, it just elevated me to a different, different level. So didn't let that bother me. And for 20 minutes, we're fighting on the side of the bed. He pushes down till we get to the base of the bed. And then finally to the other side of the bed and he grabs a, he grabs a phone cord. And I thought, well, that's a pretty good idea. I'll take that from him. And I wrapped it around his neck, um, held him down with my, with my two elbows and then use my left hand to um, grab the phone and call 911. And that's interesting there because I this is Palo Alto. So this kind of stuff doesn't happen. Mm -hmm. And they, they certainly didn't believe me. So I was, you know, and the person person says, we'll send officers right away. But why, why is this guy here? And I started saying, he said, said something about these papers he wanted from the wrestling coach. And then they're like, well, what does that mean? So I said, you know, what does that mean? And I kind of grabbed him and he's like, well, Stanford's a rich university and they have, they have all this money and the wrestling team has all this money. And I kind of lost it on him because you know, I was like, we're a self-funding program. And, you know, we're, you know, so it'd be an interesting police tape to listen to. Anyways, um, Smokes. police officers get to the door in, in just like seven minutes. 
And then, then they say, we need supervisor approval for them to knock down the door. I said, I'm giving you my approval. I'm in the back room. I can't get up. I'm tied up. If there's, there's a gun somewhere, um, just knock down the door. And they said, well, we can't do that until you know, our supervisor tells us we can. And it took about 20 minutes for them to get approval. But 20 finally, minutes. 20 minutes. Yeah. And, you know, and at that time, and again, glad I'm a wrestler because, you know, I can, I can deal with a lot more than other people can. I'm going to, I'm going to say that, you know, like Dave Schultz said, there's wrestlers and civilians. Um, wrestlers can, wrestlers can deal with a lot of, a lot of pain, whereas a civilian can't. Thank goodness this other guy was a civilian. So, um, you know, I've, I've got him secured and he's kind of, he's kind of out of, out of. He's got to be exhausted. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I was, beat the shit out of him for 20 minutes and I mean, uh, just, I can't even imagine. So the cops walk in, what happens then? Yeah, they came in guns blazing. They were shocked. And, you know, like this is, and back room's all messed up. There's blood, blood on the walls. It's got to be just, and I'm going to quote Joe DeSena. This is like a scene out of Pulp Fiction. You know, you got a guy half, half tied up and, you know, beating up this, beating up this other guy. Um, but then they, they hauled him out of there and, and, uh, you know, we went around, went around the room. This, this guy, you know, had, had found a knife in the house and had brought it in the back room. And, you know, it, it basically looks like he was, he was a stalker, which is strange to me because there's a lot better, you know, looking people and, you know, in the world that this guy could go after. So I'm not quite sure what was going on, but I will say super glad I had wrestling. And I will also say this, and this is, you know, this is me not being humbled, but it's something I'm proud of. Um, but the next day, the next, the next day, this police officer came over and, you know, she was asking how I was and, and things like that. And she was dating one of the guys on the EMT crew that, uh, that picked this guy up. And she said, she said, she checked on me and I, you know, that I was okay and stuff like that. And, and then I said, oh, and then she said, you know, I, I got to tell you, she goes, the guys on the EMT crew, you're like a cult hero for them. And I just asked, you know, why is that? And she said, because all of them said they'd never seen anyone get beat up that badly by just one person. You know, so, I so know, I'll, too. I'll take it. I'll take yeah. it. Um, but let's let's go back to the theme of the podcast. You know, but where am I without wrestling in that situation? And again, where am I? Where am I without my dad? So um, that's you know, wrestling. Wrestling changed my life, but wrestling literally saved my life too. Saved your life, and there's a lot that comes after. We're gonna get to just to put a bow on this for people who are wondering. What inspired the sicko to do all this? And like, whatever happened with that, just to put a bow on that end of it. You know, um, there's a long story that I won't get into, but, but he was, he was a stalker um, and they went to his, they went, you know, and interviewed him at the hospital, I guess, between times when he was vomiting blood again. Yeah. Strangely, it makes me feel good about myself. Yeah. Uh, but, but uh, you know, he, he, I had been getting, I had been getting mail for, over a year. And it was really bizarre, bizarre books and, and things like that. Um, and I just thought it was wrestlers on the team that were messing with me. So I was, I had them all and I was hanging on to him until I found out who it was. And then I was going to stick all that stuff in their locker. Um, but you know, when the detective was going around the room, they saw this big stack of books and I was like, Oh gosh, he's going to think I'm crazy. So I said, that stack of books, wrestlers are sending me that stuff. And that's, that's not my stuff. And he's like, are you sure? So the detective goes and interviews this guy at the hospital. And, you know, he admitted he had been sending me that stuff. He had met me two weeks prior to this incident, but I'd been getting that stuff for about a year. So um, he had, he had been sending that stuff and they went to his, they went to where he lived and he lived in the, in the corner of this, this apartment. And he basically had a futon and a picture of me on the wall, which again, I, I don't understand. Um, but it's, it's all like, it's all like living a movie and I'm just super happy that I didn't know about this stuff for a long time. Um, I think there's some people that get stalked that are, you know, constantly nervous about their stalker. I didn't know any of this was going on. And my, my incident only lasted, you know, a really intense three hours as opposed to extending out. Uh, I will say he went to, he went to prison. Um, and part of it's because he's, he's was from Peru and one of my dad's wrestlers dads, so my dad coaches high school wrestling. His wrestler's dad was the assistant to the attorney general in charge of immigration. Mm. So he, he got in this thing. His name's Don Reno. He's a fantastic guy, former, former wrestler as well. And he, he got in there 
Um, this guy got sentenced to eight years in prison for kidnapping and false imprisonment. And then Don Reno made sure that this guy, this guy was deported directly after this happens. And if he ever comes back in the country, um, then he gets put away again. So wow. That, that's the bow. Oh my God. So in the days after this, how did you know, your background with discipline and wrestling help with the mental side of this and getting over it? And it's because that to me is, you know, a, a, a big part of any traumatic situation is the days afterwards. And, and in a very, very, very small scale, you could say, Hey, you went to nationals as a college wrestler, you didn't place and you're depressed for months after this has nothing to do with that. But how'd you get over some of the mental stuff afterwards? Are there any routines you used? Um, it was tough. I'll, I'll be honest. Emotionally, it was very, very difficult afterwards. If you're, if you're that close to, if you're that close to death, um, you know, it's a whole, whole different scene and it, you know, and you can, you can sit there and, and wallow and pity about it. Like I almost died. And what if it happens again and get yourself all nervous or you can, or you can be the person that's like, okay, um, that happened and I'm still going to deal with this emotionally, but how can I use this to make myself better? It's just like, you know, if you lose you, you, you reference, if you lose a tournament um, and you didn't wrestle well, you can wallow in pity and just feel sorry for yourself or, and that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. It's going to happen. You're, you're naturally going to do that because emotions are emotions are things we have. Um, but then you got to say, okay, how am I going to, how am I going to fix this? And how can I use it to make, make me a better wrestler? In this case, you know, I was dealing with some pretty, pretty decent emotions, but I was also doing some soul searching. And if you're, if you're someone that's gone through a near death experience, you're going to really start thinking about what your life's about. And along with, along with coaching wrestling at the time I was working in an advertising agency. And that's what I thought my career was going to be. I was going to go into advertising because it sounded like fun. But then I started soul searching and saying to myself, you know, is this something I really want to do? Am I really producing for society? And, you know, I had to determine that, no, I wasn't, you know, I was making, I was making um, like the last thing I did, I was making a menu for Armadillo Willie's uh, barbecue restaurant. And I was trying to find Armadillo. Farm. <laughs> so I was saying yeah. to myself, you know, that's, that's not that, that's not that powerful. So at that time, that's when I said, I'm going to, I'm going to change, I'm going to change my life here. And I'm going to, I'm going to go get my, get my teaching credentials. So I started applying to grad school after that um, to get my teaching credentials. Cause what I, what I decided that I wanted to do is I wanted to do for other, for other kids, you know, for other, for students and, you know, other young people, what my dad did for me, you know, how to, how to, you know, learn to push yourself and how to, you know, how to deal with that stuff and, you know, how to coach someone through that. So again, the emotions were there and it took, it took a while. I can say it, it took several months for me to say to myself, actually, I didn't think about the whole incident for, for 24 hours there. That's amazing. Um, so I thought about it quite a bit, but I also wanted to use it as, as a way to make myself better. Thanks for listening to this episode of the combat series on Spartan Up podcast. Spartan Up is your partner in resilience for mind, body, and spirit. We're here three days every week. Tuesdays, you can find Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan, interviewing biohackers, business leaders, authors, and athletes. Thursdays and Saturdays, catch episodes from our DECA, Endurance, Trail, Combat, and LaRuta series. Do you know someone who needs a little nudge? Maybe they could use some motivation, tactics to be stronger, healthier, happier, more successful. Tell them about our show. And if you're watching on YouTube, leave us a comment. We want to know who's watching and who's listening. Thanks. See you next time. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by our friends Juliet and Kelly Starrett at The Ready State. Get a free trial and then save 10% for life by using the code SPARTAN10 when you register at thereadystate.com.